Knuckles comic issue 20. We start out in the past with Locke not being told what his wife is doing by her, and she is forbidden from taking her son with him, even though she says, what kind of childhood is that? When it comes to the guardian childhood. I feel pretty sorry for her. I get why she's saying that, but does she think every guardian's childhood is terrible? Or is she just referring to Knuckles' unique situation? Meanwhile, we cut back to Jeffrey and his friends somehow not recognizing Princess Prince Elise, Prince Elias, and being too paranoid to believe it's him, even though he himself admits he's a spitting image of his father. Jeffrey has a good point, though, in that the king never talks about his son. I can't accept the premise of a father forgetting he has a son somewhere. And then after Elias agrees with him, he says some philosophical gibberish I can't understand the meaning of at first. You are more likely his instrument sent here to divine fact from fiction no matter what the outcome. I think by divine he meant the very seldom used verb of it, not the adjective of it, which is used a lot more. But why would the king not believe Elias was who he said he was? Why is he suspicious of him at all? This is such forced artificial conflict. Then on day two, when the constable tries to tell Knuckles to wait here, Knuckles gives him a good comeback. I have a better idea, Constable. You and your troops can stay on board and twiddle your thumbs for all I care, while I go aboard that craft and see if my mother is alive and well. That's a very good point. For some reason, he's warned of walking into a trap. How paranoid are they? Knuckles fortunately fails to find his mother before they can talk, and Lara says that actually, Locke was the one who left her, taking Knuckles from the city that he spent his whole life in by that point to the floating island, which as far as Lara knew was still a desolate wasteland. And Lara didn't even know what even was? Why are the Guardians so secret about stuff that they won't even tell their own wives about one of those important parts of their jobs? Sounds like none of them could really have healthy relationships then. She has a good point. Why didn't you tell me any of this before? We then see Locke and Lara's airship having interference from the weather while they're about to go into the Forbidden Zone. Then we see that Elias has a homing rod given to the Queen before she was sent away, which seems to have a chaos symbol on it. It was there just in case he needed to call for help. Wait a minute, first he says that the royal object was from King Acorn, and then he says Saber gave it to him, and he has no idea where Saber got it. And Jeffrey doesn't even question the random changing of stories! Instead, he gets distracted by the smell of tea and decides to question the Colonel. Oh, great. The video was broken, wasn't even bothered to be fixed years later. So I had to get the rest of this story from a different source. Anyways, Jeffrey surprises the Colonel with the Royal Scepter for some reason, even though he should have been used to Elias having it by now. Was he keeping it from him ever since he was a baby? Jeffrey reminds the Colonel that he was among the Queen's Guardsmen on that lost mission. At first, the Colonel thought Jeffrey was a ghost until he remembered seeing his younger self as they readied the escape craft for the Queen. The Colonel was Jeffrey's father's right-hand man back then, so naturally he was the one turned to for an important task. They needed a pod to transport the Prince with them safely, because the airship was already a big enough target with both the Queen and the Prince on board. Unfortunately, the airship was hit with the Queen and Prince on it on the way to the floating island. The Queen, after being worried about her son, is told that he's being taken care of, and after he was secured, the Colonel rushed to the cockpit where it turns out they were being attacked by overlanders who were using the island as cover. The airship crashed, and the Colonel never found a trace of anyone in the wreckage. It took years for him to discover Elias wandering around outside the compound, and he discovered because of a special birthmark that he was the real deal. Unfortunately, Elias says that he's sworn to secrecy about how he survived the crash and instead agrees to take him to where they left him and let them decide what they want to tell him. They, as in the Brotherhood. Okay, so they did do one important thing. That one thing alone does justify their existence. We then see Knuckles naturally really worried about his mother disappearing in a snowstorm, and the constable annoys me by not caring at all and having a dismissive reaction that lots of strange things happen here. Unfortunately, the airship they were in gets struck by lightning, and then we cut to Lara, reminding Locke that, that the tomes his father made sure that he would study talk about a cleansing process that occurs in nature every so often. A day of fury. Another one so soon? I thought that only happened every couple hundred years. She then looks sad and says that his lack of faith is one of many reasons she came out there looking for him. I guess lack of faith as in he doesn't have faith in her and that's why he doesn't tell her anything? She's unable to finish her train of thought as Locke gets a signal picked up on his scanner. 
Lara complains that she didn't come all this way to do adventuring with him, and came here to discuss their son and the lousy job he did as a parent. While he was inclined to strongly disagree with her, they'll have to wait a little longer, which is a shame. We then cut to Jeffrey, his elite, and Elias holding on to a bunch of trees in a flood and saying optimistically that as long as he holds his homing rod, they'll have nothing to fear, while Locke's airship is driving towards them. Then Knuckles wakes up with no power in the airship, complaining about a headache, finds everyone out cold, decides to go outside to see how bad the damage to the ship is, and immediately realizes where he is. It's where his father abandoned him. And after he walks for just a little while, he gets completely incinerated, never to be seen again. Nah, just kidding. It turns out that he immediately gets teleported to the Brotherhood, finally getting to meet up with his grandpa Saber. Oh, and Archimedes, he was there too. This story was written by Ken Penders, and it doesn't really resolve the plot points of the previous story because it's still right in the middle of the action the whole time. After all, it is in the middle of a story arc. Lara and Locke don't get to really have a discussion because of everything going on to interrupt them, though I can't imagine it would realistically lead to any good anyways. They would just argue. Locke would never really realize he was doing anything wrong. Locke does kiss her cheek at one point, so they do still care about each other, but it's obvious their relationship is too dysfunctional from all the arguing. We find out Ilias is the real deal, big surprise, and that he has a homing rod that spontaneously changes backstories in the span of a few panels. First it's from King Acorn, and definitely a royal scepter, and then it was from the Brotherhood. I'm glad they resolved Jeffrey's paranoia about him because that was really arbitrary and annoying. I like Elias so far, he seems like a smart, sympathetic, and capable boy. Like a male Sally, I guess. And I really like how they have the two main plots intersect, with Jeffrey and his do-nothing elites being picked up by Locke and Lara. Knuckles' story was pretty pointless though, but it did do well to show that he cares about his mother, and at the end, he finally gets to meet the Brotherhood.